Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our RimWorld Extreme Desert Challenge. Last time we left off after completing a raid with Jake and Steak, and we also slightly increased the pacing of the episode, and as far as I could tell from your comments, most of you liked the slightly more action-oriented focus. Now, one big thing today is going to be the cleanup of our storage room. We are at full capacity and that doesn't have to be the case. So let's make some room for those items that actually need to be stored inside. Stone blocks, for example, do not fall into that category and can safely be stored outside. With the sun rising, our small caravan is now also moving again, albeit somewhat slowly, as Jake is still recovering from a few injuries. Meanwhile, back in the base, we are now putting down our first mortar. It is quite expensive with 225 steel, but mortars can make things a lot easier when we encounter sieges or mech clusters, so we definitely want to have a few of them down the line. For now, though, one is enough, our steel supply is limited after all. Speaking of steel, we are also making some high explosive shells now, otherwise the mortar remains rather useless, and those require a hefty amount of materials as well, 25 units of steel and 15 units of chem fuel per shell, so the mortar is certainly a resource intensive weapon that we should use sparingly for the moment. These mortar shells should ideally be stored near the mortar for efficient firing and reloading, so let's move the shelf a bit closer to reduce the walking distance. With our first batch of camp fuel, we can then make the stunning amount of two whole shells, so you can imagine how long it will take and how many resources it will cost to build up a respectable arsenal. It's a good thing though that mortar shells can also be bought from traders, so let's increase our supply of flake, which is likely going to be our main trade good going forward. Redhog, meanwhile, has found a new steel vein to mine, as the mortar and shells have more or less depleted all that we had left. With a nice rain setting in, we can now also sacrifice a bit more food to make more chem fuel. I am just a little uncomfortable with only two mortar shells, which probably won't do as much good, considering the mortar's accuracy is pretty bad. Right before our caravan then stops to rest, they encounter a group of traders, and we have brought back some valuables from the pirate camp, so let's see if we can make something happen here. Okay, so selling a few clothing items, we can make just enough silver to purchase a goose, and that is actually something I have wanted to do for quite some time. Geese and chicken are the two most efficient egg-laying animals in the game, and eggs can be used as a substitute for meat, which is already important for our dog's kibble supply, and will become even more important as we switch our colony over to fine meals, all of which can be made with eggs as well. Now, I would have liked to buy a male goose as well, but we don't quite have the funds for it. It shouldn't be that hard to acquire one down the line, though. On the next morning, Admo adds two more mortar shells to the shelf and can then start working on a cowboy hat for Redhawk. We are also informed that Labrador Noosa is pregnant, so more puppies are on the way, and the cowboy hat is quickly finished, and so Redhawk now has some heat-protecting headgear as well, something her old tribal headdress did not really offer. Now, since we have purchased a goose and will probably have a few more incoming down the line, let's increase our hay production next. I have found a good spot not too far away from the colony that we can now fence in and then start planting, just like we're already doing to the southwest of the steakhouse. Good news then on the caravan front, Jake has made a full recovery and our two colonists are also about to reach their first stop, the Black Trosca tribe. We can sell a few more things here, enough to buy some more meat. As long as we are not raising our own meat animals, this ensures that our dogs have something to eat. Once again then, night sets across the desert and we jump ahead to the next morning, which presents us with a problematic encounter. A pack of man-hunting deer is attacking, and that wouldn't be such a problem under normal circumstances. But, as you can see, they have spawned right next to Redhawk's mining spot, and they are a little faster than a human colonist. So, let's get both the Redhawk and our two dogs out of the fray. They can hopefully outrun the animals until they reach the base. 
Things are looking good so far, our turrets are ready to fire at any moment, and Red Hawk dodges the first attack here, so let's hope she can make it into safety. Okay, that was a close call, but Red Hawk is safe and that is all that counts. Our turrets will now do some good damage, but we'll turn them off in a moment, otherwise the animals will probably destroy them all. Our two dogs, meanwhile, have unfortunately also joined the fight, and while they can take down a deer or two, they can of course not take on the entire group. Interestingly enough, the only way to get them to run into safety is to unassign their master, otherwise they will remain in combat mode as long as their assigned master is also drafted. And with that, the worst part of this fight is now over. I have forbidden all doors leading out of the base, but of course we will eventually have to take care of these animals. Some periodic turret fire helps us thin out their numbers, but as you can see, it is not the most effective strategy. One very important thing at this point, our caravan should of course not return to the steakhouse just yet, otherwise I fear they would get slaughtered by the deer, and that would be unacceptable. So Jake, Steak and the alpacas will just rest outside the colony until things have quieted down, which is going to take a while, I think. For the time being, the animals are not really causing any trouble though. Sure, we have lost a few traps, but we are more or less self-sufficient behind our gates, which is why we will send everyone to bed for now. However, with Edmo fully rested a few hours later, we can lure a few more animals into our kill box, which results in a slight reduction in enemy numbers, but doesn't solve the problem just yet. Eventually then, with only a handful of deer remaining, we switch to a different tactic, I call this the peekaboo, and against a small number of manhunting animals it is surprisingly effective. We only have to make sure to repair the door from time to time, and then, with a bit of patience, we can slowly decimate the deer until the threat is removed. And there we go, that was the last deer. Our colony is finally safe again, we should be able to harvest at least some meat from the corpses, and Jake and Steak can also finally return. Before we see them back though, we have a transport pod crash to report. Inside we find a smoke launcher that we will definitely grab, as well as a colonist who looks pretty useful. A dedicated doctor who can do some artwork, animal handling or research on the side, all of that without any horrible traits, I think that is something that we should look into. Theoretically speaking, recruiting her would allow Redhawk to take over more plant work, which in turn might free up Edmo for some more crafting, so I'm very much intrigued, especially since she also doesn't have any long-term injuries or illnesses. So as our caravan finally arrives back home, we can quickly rename the goose to Violet, another name chosen from the list of patrons in the naming rights tier and above, and then we can see to our patient in the hopes that she makes a speedy recovery and perhaps decides to join us afterwards. Now the rest of the day is spent with burning deer corpses and catching up on all of those tasks that suffered a bit over the last day, but until the evening rolls around we luckily have no further disturbances to report. On the next morning then we can watch Troy make even more drugs. I am eagerly awaiting that first trade haul with all the flake we're making, while Jake and Steak finish the outlines of our new hay plantation and can now remove the roof they accidentally built because I wasn't quick enough to tell them not to. The afternoon then continues with a bit of repair work around the defenses, and then it slowly starts getting dark already, and so another day in the extreme desert comes to an uneventful end. On the next morning, Jake and Redhawk begin their day with some serious planting duty, but they are well experienced by now, so it doesn't take them too long. 
Back in the base, meanwhile, we can now start butchering the two deer corpses that did not rot instantly, and this will give us enough meat to make more kibble, as our dogs are starting to run low. In the evening, then, we make a bit more flake, but all in all, it is another unspectacular day. So once more, let us jump ahead to the next morning. Over the last few days, we have gathered plenty of steel, which now allows us to construct three more hydroponics basins. And we will go with the default here and grow rice in these. As our colony grows, the options to use rice increase as well. Not only can we turn it into meals for our colonists, but also into camp fuel and maybe even into kibble, should the hay grass not grow quick enough. The next batch of flake production then brings our supply past the 50 unit mark. And with a price of 14 silver per unit, I think we are slowly starting to approach worthwhile territory here. What follows are some good but also disappointing news from the hospital. Thanks to our help, our patient has made a full recovery, but it doesn't look like she's going to stick around. We are on relatively good terms with her faction though, so we'll let this happen. As she exits the map in the evening, we even get a big bonus to our faction relations. As a matter of fact, we are only 25 points away from acquiring our first ally. The rest of the evening then remains uneventful, but with the sun barely shining over the horizon, we have intriguing plans on the next morning. From our last quest, we obtained this beauty here, a hand talon. And honestly, this is a pretty good melee weapon, which comes with the big benefit of allowing its user, if you will, to still carry a gun into battle as well. And well, who would be better suited for something like this than good old Edmo? He is very competent in both the melee and the shooting skill, and installing the hand talon on him allows him maximum flexibility. Interestingly enough, this hand talon also does not seem to impact the hand in any negative way, so Edmo's manipulation stat will not actually decrease from this, which means he will be just as useful in all the non-combat skills as he was before. And the surgery is a success, which also improves Redhawk's medical skill to level 10. Edmo, on the other hand, will now be sidelined for a bit. Later that day, then, my absolute favorite event in the entire game. An electrical conduit has caused a fire, all of our batteries have discharged, and to top it all off, our dogs Louis and Natalie both run right through the flames. Now the damages are quickly repaired, but the batteries could become a problem. We are relying purely on wind and solar power after all, and as the night sets, both of those sources do not really seem to provide us with all that much juice. Luckily, our batteries last just long enough. You can see a few power problems here on the next morning, but the sun is already rising and our solar panels should be at full capacity soon. Now the two batteries discharging has made it very clear to me that perhaps we're not storing our mortar shells in the ideal spot. So let's put the shelf back where it previously was, away from anything that can easily explode. Following that, we can start the next round of kibble production. Still a bit dizzy from the operation, Edmo can butcher the second deer, while Redhawk and Jake harvest a bunch of hay. And with harvesting and meal making taking up most of the day, we can rejoin our colony in the evening, where we are informed that our donkey Tiemo has gotten sick with the plague. Now, compared to colonists, animals are usually a bit more resilient when it comes to sicknesses, but of course Tiemo will get some rest and some medical care right away. Unfortunately, things do in fact get worse for our colony during the night, as a psychic drone hits the desert and causes more than just a mild annoyance for all male colonists. At the medium level, the mood penalty here is a whopping minus 22, so depending on how long the drone lasts, we might see one or two mental breaks. Luckily though, for the time being, the steakhouse is already fast asleep. On the following morning then, something happens that I have been waiting for for quite some time. Our large field of psychoid plants is finally ready to be harvested. Thanks to the combined efforts of Edmo, Jake and Redhawk, we are bringing in more than 200 units here. And shortly after, we can watch as Troy attempts to keep up with the flake production. Things do unfortunately take another turn for the worse, as Jake, Edmo and Troy all come down with the flu. 
Now, on the bright side, our Dr. Redhawk is fortunately not affected, and since our three colonists are otherwise healthy, this will not be anything life-threatening. Still, I have a feeling that the steakhouse's production will take a slight hit in the near future. Before the night fully sets, though, everyone has already received their treatment, so hopefully this is all going to be just a slight bump in the road. Now, at this point, we have once again completed 10 in-game days, and I think that is a good point to make the cut. I have actually recorded much more footage than usual, and still this video ended up on the shorter side, but how long the final video is eventually going to be is sometimes a bit hard to predict from just the length of footage alone. Sometimes 40 minutes are enough to fill a 20 minute video, other times, and this was the case today, more than one and a half hours will result in just the same. In any case, I do hope that you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, then I would of course be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peakcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Peak Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.